Welcome to our 11th lecture in Computer Programming 2. In this lecture, we're going to look at user interface design, and we're going to look at how that relates to programming assignment number three. The example that I'm going to do in class will closely mirror programming assignment number three, as usual. So once you finish this series of lectures, you should be ready to continue with, computer, uh, with programming assignment number three. Now, what we're looking at is how to add a new user interface to an existing program. And this is a metaphor for many things that we do in programming, where maybe we want to change one part of a program, but preserve the rest of it. And we want to do it in an efficient manner. So this exercise is really going to show how dividing up our program into the different classes that we had it in before will pay off well. Many times in a Computer Programming 2 course like this, people are wondering, why do I have to put everything in different classes? Why can't I put everything into one class? Why can't I put everything into one method? Why can't I just do the whole program in main? Or, why can't I prompt the user from my account class? Why does it have to be in Banker? Uh, why can't I do calculations in my Banker class? In this assignment, we're going to see if we have designed things well, if we have separated our user interface and business logic, it's going to be very easy to add a new user interface. And this is something that we've seen happen over the life cycle, over the lifetime of information technology. We've come across this problem or this dilemma many times in the past. This is nothing new. And it's something that will probably always be with us. The concept that we write a program, and then we need another way to display the program. So let's take a look at assignment three to start, and then we're going to take a look at a history of user interfaces in computing. This is, is assignment descriptions go, this is probably one of the shortest. Uh, due August the 1st, and then the hard deadline on August the 3rd. Uh, what we want to do here is we want to continue to use the existing structure we have from programming assignment 2. We want an account, and we want to extend that with checking, savings, and CD. We want a banker class, okay? But what we're going to add this time is a new class called banker frame. This is going to reuse all of the existing logic that we have in banker, okay? I'm sorry not in Banker, in Account, Checking, Saving, CD, but with a different user interface. And here are all of our requirements. Banker frame should be a J frame. I'll show you how to do that. It should have areas for input and output, including a J text area, a J label, okay? It should have one for each type of data that we're inputting. It should have a way to calculate interest. Uh, it should have a way to reject invalid user input. All of these things very straightforward. And you see those are your requirements. Uh, you have some leeway on how you choose to implement them. Also, uh, do something extra. As always, comment the program, and it has to compile for me to grade it. If I receive something that doesn't compile, I will not grade it. Okay, as always, I want to do the uh, grade sheet that follows, and then you're all set. Okay, so a quick history of uh, of, of computer programming. First of all, or user interfaces. What we're going to cover in the slides is this drop-down menu called UI. Okay, and so what is a UI? Well, we have this, we, we kind of have this, have had this debate over the last 10 years of a fat client versus a thin client. If you think back to the 90s, we had this revolution of the personal computer and this idea that you had a lot of processing power and memory on your computer. And this brought a whole new generation of programs. We had a graphical Windows environment, windowing environment, which we called Windows, and it made things more user-friendly than they were in the past. So there was a big push to make what we called fat client programs, or in other words, programs that run on the PC or the laptop and harness all of the power of the PC or the laptop. 
think about that. What kind of fat client programs have you used? In other words, if you're on a Windows machine, uh, what programs do you access by choosing Start? And then Programs, and then you access something from there. And it runs on your computer. Your computer doesn't have to be connected to a network. Well, one obvious one is our friend NetBeans. NetBeans is a fat client program, and it's written in Java. So each of these little things we interact with here are pieces of Java. This is written using the Swing uh, user interface platform, which is what we're going to use in our programs too. And we'll see over here we have Swing controls. So this is an example of a fat client program. It's running entirely on my computer. And these things became very big in the 90s. Okay, so uh, the opposite of a fat client then is a thin client program. And these are things that we typically access through a browser. So we need to be online to do them. If you think about something like, uh, well, okay, something that, that I'll do on a somewhat frequent basis. Let me bring this guy over. And that is manage, um, manage my trips. Okay, this is something I'll do over a browser. Uh, naturally, I can go on here. We'll expand this a bit. And uh, let's see, I can go down here and choose a seat if I wish. Okay, we'll give it a second. Uh, but this is an example of some data entry that I can do over a browser. So this is what we would call a thin client program. If I wanted, um, I'll tell you a trick in two tricks in, in, in booking uh, seats on an aircraft. Uh, first of all, no one's ever going to pick the middle seat. So a lot of times I'll choose the, uh, I'll choose an aisle or a window and you know, where I know that somebody else has already chosen the opposite because uh, it's unlikely anybody else would choose, would choose to sit in the middle seat. More than likely I'll get an empty seat next to me. Uh, another trick is uh, the second row of exit row usually has a lot of leg room because there's room for people to get out and also reclines where the first row of exit row doesn't. So if you can manage that, uh, that's, that's a good seat to pick. On this particular aircraft, on this particular aircraft, the real prize is the seat 33A because 32A is missing and you get basically an infinite amount of legroom. But in any case, I digress. So this is something that requires that I be connected and using a browser. This is what we would call a thin client program. Uh, there's a little bit of data entry that I can do here. I can save it. I can pull it back up uh, later on a different computer and I can see my seat selection. That's what we would call a thin client program. So there was a lot of debate between these two in the 90s. Which was better, the fat client or the thin client? And think about this. Think about what company or companies would really propose the fat client and what company or companies would really propose the thin client. Once again, I can think of an application that I use that offers both the fat and a thin client. Um, if we take a look here at Google Talk, uh, this is something that I can use to talk to my colleagues. And this is something I would start on my computer. It runs on my computer. On the other hand, I could also go to my Gmail account and uh, if we, I pull this over here, uh, notice that I could also invoke a chat from within a web browser. So that's a program that's offered either fat client or thin client. So if you think back to the 90s, who had a real vested interest in things running on a PC? And who had a real vested interest on things not running on a PC? Well, Microsoft was a big, fa big fan of the fat client because it means that you always had to buy a, a PC running Windows to use these fat client applications. Meanwhile, everybody but Microsoft was a big fan of the thin client browser-based application because then you could run it on anything. You could run it on a Mac, on Linux, Unix, or on Windows. You could run anything through a browser that was a thin client. So we tended to find things would basically fall into one of two camps. Now, when you think about your program, where is it best to run? Is it best to run completely through a browser? Or is it best to run as a fat client? And that depends. 
if we're talking purely about data entry, okay, and, uh, and we're talking about a very distributed user base, the best option is probably thin client uh, because it, it, you minimize the complexity to the user if all you do is point them to a website. On the other hand, imagine if they have to install something. I can think of a great example of this from my work history. When I worked in banking, I supported a dealer floor plan product where dealers could finance the inventory on their lot. And that we had them install a fat client program. Well, the problem is if there was an error, if something went wrong from my office in Cincinnati, I had to help this dealership in Toledo figure out what was wrong. And dealerships don't tend to be very tech savvy. So that was a very difficult process. That would have been a better choice for a thin client app where I just point them at a browser, at a, at a browser URL. Browsers usually, usually already going to be loaded on the computer. So it's a lot less complex. On the other hand, think of something like graphic design, something that requires a lot of processing power. Think of my day job, point of sale something that requires uh, the capability to be online and offline and still run when offline. So there are certain things that are better to be fat clients, things that are very graphical intense, uh, things that require a lot of robust capability and error checking when online versus offline. So this debate goes on. But what's funny is this debate is not by any stretch new. If we go back, and I have a result, one second here, I need to find my, uh, find my, oh, where'd the darn thing go? There we go. If we go back to the 70s and before, this is many times what computing looked like, okay? Many times we had something that was basically a television with one color that it could display and a keyboard. And that's what we would call a dummy terminal. And a dummy terminal was connected to a mainframe in the back. There was no real logic going on in this dummy terminal. Okay? It was just displaying something for the user and accepting input. All of the logic was happening behind the scenes on a mainframe. Okay? And that's the paradigm that computing had from its very inception all the way until right about the time the personal computer came out. What are we looking at? We're essentially looking at a thin client here, a terminal that basically all the logic is back in a back room somewhere in a mainframe. Okay. Then the PC came out and we started putting a lot of logic on the PC. Then we realized that it could be a real maintenance problem having our programs installed on all these different PCs that we didn't have control over. So that was the 90s. So then around the time 2000 rolled out, People found the internet and realized that, hey, instead of downloading and installing a program, what if we just point the user to a URL, basically treat the browser as a dummy terminal, and all of the logic then is on the back end. So we went from thin client in the mainframe days to fat client in the 80s and 90s, where we had a lot of logic installed and running on a PC back to thin client around the year 2000. And now where are we? Well, think about where programming is very popular now. Where do you tend to run programs? What's the last time you ran a program before you listened to this lecture? Where were you? Probably on your mobile phone. Now with a mobile phone, we've really hit the rewind button because we're back to fat client again. Not only that, but each of the vendors really wants to have you develop an app for them because that's what made smartphones very popular was a lot of people developing applications. And like anybody, anyone who has a smartphone has an idea for an app for it. I have a smartphone. I have an idea for an app. For me, it's the ability to track GPS locations of plants around the world. So I wrote my application for Android. But Android programming, I find pretty straightforward and easy. The problem is it locks you into Android because when you write an Android app, you can only run it on Android. Okay. Same thing with the iPhone. They really locked it down 
so that an iPhone app, if you want to write it for any other, if you want to run it on any other phone system, you have to rewrite it from scratch. This is a competitive strategy. Not only do I want you to write applications for my device, I don't want you to write applications for my competitor's device. Or at the, at the very simplest, I want to make it difficult for you to reuse my application or the, your application on a competitor's device. So basically the, the phone operating system makers and the phone hardware makers are trying to make our lives more difficult so that we'll be locked into their brand. So we need a strategy to work around this. And that's where a good object-oriented design that separates out the layers will give us a bit of an advantage. So we see thin client in the mainframe days, fat client when we got the PCs in the 80s and the 90s, back to thin client when we did user interfaces in over the web, back to fat client again while we're on the mobile phone. Now, if you asked me about this seven years ago when I taught this class, we would have stopped right when I said thin client on the browser because mobile phone apps weren't big at all back then. You really, I mean, even just seven years ago, 2005, you wouldn't even really think about writing a, uh, a, an app for a mobile phone. I remember at Java 1 in 2001 and when I purchased a mobile phone in um, 2006, both times I said, can I write Java programs for this? And the people didn't know. And this is number one, at Java 1, the big Java conference. Number two, uh, I think at the time I was at, I was at the AT&T store, uh, they didn't know. Um, you know, these are people who you normally think would know. It only was really when the iPhone came out that writing applications for a mobile phone became immensely popular. And now it's crazy popular. Now it's what everybody wants to do. So we see that these things shift over time. And also we start to see that the line gets gray. I said that a fat client is something that runs on a device like a Windows, a Windows desktop or maybe a mobile phone. But how do we count something like this? This is Google Documents, and this is a list going back six years on everything I've ever wanted to do on plant places. And this is a growing list. Things I've done are purple. Things I've not done are black. Okay, this list grows all the time. But notice I access it over the web. Here's a presentation that we used earlier this quarter and once again, this is a Google Docs presentation accessed over the web. Is that thin client or fat client? Well, it's kind of a hybrid, kind of a hybrid of both. So we start to see some mixtures of this thin and fat client. Now, how about Argo UML? This is the application that we use to draw our UML diagrams. So I'm going to click and it will launch via Java Web Start. Simply give an approval here. And what this is, I'm going to talk a little bit about Java Web Start as this is loading. What this is, is a way to launch a fat client program from the web instead of from your start button. What's interesting is this manages things like versioning, okay? Versioning, keeping the source up to date. So the first time I launch this, it's going to download it and basically keep it in memory. And then it's going to run it from the web. The next time I click, it's going to run much quicker because it already has this application saved on my computer. And then all it's going to do is push down any updates, okay? Push down any updates from uh, that have happened since the last time I run. And here we go. So here is a Swing application written in Java. Maybe you didn't know that. Our UML tool written in Java. Okay, so we have our old uh, banker and running on my computer, but I launched it from the web. Okay, and then we have account. Remember this guy? So this is this is a Java-based application, Java Swing application. Okay, savings. Whoops, didn't mean to do that, but okay. Come on over here. Here we go. Savings and whoops, didn't mean that either. Uh, CD and 
checking. Okay. So all this written in Java and all of it, whoops, let's do like that. Oh, whoops, need you out of the way. There we go. All of this running locally on my computer. So we have Banker, and what we're about to add now is a new Banker frame. Okay. So a swing-based application. There we go. And we know that uh, we know that also our friend NetBeans is also a swing-based application. Now there's another Java application that we interact with a lot that you might not know about, but it's not swing-based. This one's a thin client application. Okay. Blackboard. Notice that the URL ends in JSP, and that stands for Java Server Page. That means that it's Java logic behind the scenes that is rendering this page. Of course, we're looking at HTML. We know that. We're looking at HTML and some cascading style sheets. But something had to make a decision here. Something had to make an iteration. Something had to know from my login what my classes are. Okay, what classes I want to see here. Here we go. So it looks up every class I've taught in the last several years. By the way, I used Blackboard very early on, and I think my first year back around 2001 or 2002, I started using Blackboard. So actually, I have quite a few classes on here. Uh, and then I can click Programming Mobile Devices, and we see that still we're on a JSP. So the decision logic behind how to access the database, what queries to run in the database that supports Blackboard, that's all in Java, but it's not Swing. It's what's called a Java server page. And once again, this is a thin client. Okay, so uh, if I go to, whoops, let me go back there, grab the wrong one. If I go to assignments, okay, and this is my other class, so I can safely do this, I think. If I go to assignments and I click on, uh, well, I'll click on the exam, okay, and then begin. Okay, what we're going to see here is a place where I can click on information, right? And you've seen this before. Different user interface components I can use. So all of this handled by Java, but presented through a browser using HTML. So it is a thin client. Okay, so thick client, thin client, and then all of those things that happen in between. All right. So that covers the first two, th two slides, UI and then thin client and fat client. Okay, uh, next thing, uh, we won't worry too much about applets. Uh, layout managers might be a good next option to cover. Uh, I'm going to go back to NetBeans. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go, let me close this other one here. I'm going to go to our vehicles project. And I'm going to add now a new J-frame. And this is where I think you should be very happy you're taking the course right now because NetBeans comes with a very nice graphical user interface builder that we did not used to have uh, So in other IDEs. This makes this programming assignment very easy. As a matter of fact, if you haven't done programming before and you're used to this concept of drag and drop, this will be very easy, easy for you. Okay, It's more visual than what we're used to. So I'm going to right click on vehicles and I'm going to choose new and I'm going to say J-frame form. In your programming assignment, you're going to want to do this as well. I'll call mine driver frame. You'll want to call yours banker frame. Okay, driver frame. So here we go with one requirement. We're making a J-frame, and I choose Finish. Okay. Now, what I can do here is I can drag and drop. This will be a little bit tricky because I'm, you know, have have very limited real estate here on the on the screen. But I can drag and drop swing controls. Okay, the different user interface controls onto this layout. But I need to know a little bit about the layout, okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to right-click. Oh, shoot, I think that's going to be off-screen. Set layout, 
border layout. This is where things get a little bit tricky. How do we lay out our buttons? Remember I told you about the dealer floor plan application? The first dealership I went to had a very old monitor. I was assured that this is a very tech savvy dealer and they'll love this stuff. I went there. They had a very old monitor that had a very low resolution and as soon as we loaded the software you could hardly see anything on it because it did not resize. Okay, we need to think seriously about resizing. Okay, and we do that with layout managers. So, layout managers tell us where will the individual components go on each of our forms, on our forms. Okay, and more importantly, what happens when we resize our forms? Layout management is important on fat applications like this, fat client applications like this. It's also very important on thin client applications that you'll see over the web. And of course, it's also important on mobile phone applications. There's a bit of a science to layout management. We have to think about how we can nest, how we can put one layout manager inside of another layout manager. Let's take a look at an example. Now, this slide is very old. This slide goes back to about 2002. Here's the old Yahoo Instant Messenger. So, uh, does anybody use that anymore? I know right now the popular thing to use is, is Google Talk. And so we have, we have this kind of thing, which is basically the same kind of idea, a bit of a simpler user interface. So, um, if I click on a user here, there we go, uh, I can start chatting in here, and we see I can resize. Now, I can enter text down below. I kind of like this simpler interface. I can enter text down below. We see I can resize several different ways like so. Okay. What happens when I drag and make the text, make the screen wider? What do I want to get wider? Okay. What happens when I make it taller? What do I want to get taller? Notice that this is where the conversation will go in the middle. And down here is where I will type. But I'll typically type one thing at a time. So when we're designing an application, we have to ask ourselves, when we drag it to make it taller, what do we want to have occupy that extra space? Here, it's going to be the conversation. Do we need these buttons to get taller? No, absolutely not. Do we need the title bar to get taller? No, we don't. Do we need the text entry to get taller? Probably not, because we're typically only entering one line at a time. Now, if I make it wider, what gets wider? Do I need this bar to get wider? No, I don't. I really want the, the conversation history and the text entry to get wider. So, it's a bit tricky to do this. We have to think about how to nest layouts. Let's look at my old example from Yahoo. Okay, this is an old Yahoo IM screen. This was by default how it looks. Now, I would stretch this out using this bar down here and take a look. Once again, just as we saw, the conversation area gets taller and wider, okay? And the place where I enter my text will get wider, but not taller. Other components do not change. So, we don't want to resize everything proportionally because there might be certain things that we actually want to have use that extra space when we scroll like so. Okay, let's look at a few of the different layout tools that we have at our disposal. And what's interesting is, you know, I'm teaching the Android class this quarter as well. Many of these layout tools, or many of these layout managers, we'll see in Android and in any other layout. I mean, these are common. The concept of a flow layout is something that we see in Swing, but we also see in other uh, programming platforms as well. A flow layout allows us to put components on the layout and it will respect their size. In other words, we can put components on there like buttons and the buttons will maintain their size. They'll typically line up next to each other and then when they run out of room, they'll make a new row like so. Flow layout simply flows from left to right. Each time we add something new, it goes to the right of what was there before. If it's out of room, it will go to a new row. 
So that's a flow layout, very simple. Again, something very similar uh, appears in Android, in Android layouts. So these things we talk about, like layout managers, even if you never do swing programming, you'll probably come across them again. Okay, grid layout. Now a grid layout will specify a number of columns or a number of rows. That's typically how we do it. And whichever number we don't specify will get calculated for us. In this case, for example, I've specified three columns. I put on a label, a text entry, and a button. And notice when I resize, they all resize proportionally. So a grid layout, we specify columns or rows, typically not both. And it does not respect the size of the components. Okay. In other words, each, each cell is exactly the same size. Regardless of how big that button wants to be, it's going to be the same size as every other component because every cell is going to be the same size. And when we resize, each of the cells gets proportionally bigger. So when I resize this entire, uh, when I resize from this to this, we see that everything gets equally bigger. So flow layout and grid layout, those are two of the things that we're going to use. Okay. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, another layout we're going to use, this one's probably the most confusing, but one of the most important border layout. If you went to elementary school in Fairfield, you'll know what I'm talking about here because they're named after Fairfield's elementary schools. In the border layout, we have north, south, west, east, and center. Although I understand things have changed and now there's a northeast school in Fairfield. Um, and I don't know if there ever was an east. I know I, I personally went to north, south, and west. Those were the elementary schools I went to and Fairfield in the 80s. But in any case, this is the one, while it's confusing, this is the one that actually makes the most sense. We have these five regions. North is the top. It will get wider, but not taller as the screen changes. South is at the bottom. It will also get wider. It will get more width. It will not get taller. West is the region over here. It will get taller, but not wider. East, right here, will get taller but not wider. Center will get taller and wider. So if I take this border component here and I stretch it out, notice what gets taller. Let me see if I can try and get these both on one screen. A little bit tricky. Notice what gets taller. Notice what gets wider. Notice what doesn't get taller. Notice what doesn't get wider. Notice what gets both taller and wider. So border layout. Five areas. North gets wider but not taller. South gets wider but not taller. West, I don't have anything there right now, but West gets taller, not wider. East gets taller, not wider. Center gets taller and wider, okay? And so this one becomes very handy. This one becomes very handy. Now, if we look at uh, nesting layouts, Okay, how could we make something like this? We would probably have to nest a lot of layouts. We'd need the major layout to be a border layout. And then within the border layout, we'd have a flow layout for the menu, a flow layout for these icons, maybe another flow layout for this um, to and from here. And then this would be in center. Then this would be in the south. And within the south, we'd have a flow layout for these icons a border layout for the little talk area here and the send button. Now with the border layout, we have five regions, but we don't have to use all five. In this case, we'd have a border layout with a little text entry in center and a send button on east and that's it. Okay. Now with the border layout, we can only have one component in each region, but what we can do is we can have that component be a panel and then we can put other components on that panel. So in other words, we can nest. By default, a border layout can only have one component uh, per region, northeast, southwest, and center. But that one component can be a panel, 
and that panel can contain other components. So we can only have one direct component. Uh, we'll see a bit of that as we do an example. Okay. One other thing we'll want to look at is what are these swing components? If you go to where Java is installed, you can find this thing called Swing Set 2. Click on it, and it will show you a lot of these different swing components that you can use and the source code to use them. This is really handy to take a look at a lot of the different swing components that you can use when programming. Here we have an internal frame. Okay, we have a modal frame here. I click over here and we see we have buttons and buttons like so. We can change whether they have a, a border, focus, whether they're enabled or what they look like when disabled. Okay, what they look like with content, how much they're padded, how to change the padding, where to align the content. Okay, so where do we put the, where do we put the, the text? Okay, the text position. Radio buttons, this one's pretty handy. So we see we can have default radio buttons. With a radio button, you can only select one at a time. But then we can also use images where we have a mouse over that's red and then it changes to blue. It's very interesting. The swing components in Java are very advanced. Uh, they're quite nice, actually, and it's funny that we don't see them used much. Put a border. We just don't see a lot of swing applications. Just that's kind of uh, a little bit old school. Most people who write Java are writing Java on the web. But needless to say, we'll take a look at some of this. Uh, padding. Okay, check boxes. This is pretty neat. We have what default check boxes look like. With a check box, you can select more than one. With a radio button, they're mutually exclusive, so you can only check one at a time. But with check boxes, you can select more than one. We can replace the default behavior, you see, with an image. So we mouse over, mouse over and get the kind of fingers. And then we click it and the light actually turns on. That's pretty neat. You see, so we don't have to be stuck with this, this old boxy user interface that we're so used to. We can do things like this and put some fancy images on. And once again, all the source code is provided for you if uh, that's something of interest to you. Okay. Uh, color picker. This is big for plant places, the ability to do a color picker. A gradient. Okay, it's a screen capture. It's probably going a little too wild for a screen, uh, scre uh, screen, you know, well, whatever. It's probably going a little too fast for a screen capture here. Uh, drop down, the ability to uh, have a drop down box that changes a little picture over here. And once again, of course, the uh, source code's available to you. But we see how we can do a drop down model. This is one of the components that we're going to use and our assignment. We're going to use drop-down boxes to be able to see the state of cars. Okay, uh, J file chooser. Boy, this one came in handy when I was doing uh, the color match search on plant places. So if we take a look on uh, plant places, let me go back to, here we go. If we take a look at plant places, one of the options that I have here is the ability to choose plants by color. Well, to do that, I had to be able to go into pictures of plants. There we go, crocus, one of my favorites. I had to be able to go into pictures of plants and actually pick these colors from the plants. Once again, the uh, data capture was very important. I wanted to just be able to pick, open a picture, select a color, and have it automatically figure out what plant that was and automatically upload the data to plant places. And so that's what I did here. As a matter of fact, do I still have... Oh, I do have Color Picker loaded. Nice, I can do that. I can show you a live example of that in just a minute. So, Preview uh, will show us a little preview. Custom J File Chooser, you could write a file chooser as you wish. So we'll take a look at this in a moment. Okay. Uh, text entry. Text entry with some uh, stylized text. Very nice. Okay, a different type of scroll bar. So scrolling pane and scrolling pane mixed with uh, scrolling pane mixed with checkboxes. That's pretty handy. 
Okay, we know this guy, right? We have our input dialog, warning dialog, okay, with some stylized text, message dialog, remember this guy? Show message dialog. Uh, component dialog, that's pretty advanced. This one you've seen before because we've used this a lot. Then the confirm dialog with yes, no, and cancel. Okay, and again, we've been using more advanced message dialogs, and if you care to see how they're written, and simply go to the uh, source code tab. Okay, a progress bar. So we see it starts to load data and it can show us progress dynamically. That's pretty handy. Okay, uh, scroll pane. So you can scroll and see, uh, see data. Okay, uh, slider bars. So all of these are different Java components that we can use, all of them quite nice. This one's pretty cool, the ability to do a split screen, like so. Okay, divider size, change that to 25 maybe, make that a bit thicker. First component's minimum size, 10. Okay, has to be greater than 10. Okay, 12, there we go. See, we can slide back and forth, change the slider, vertically split, like so. One touch expandable, wonder what that does, I don't know. Continuous layout, eh, I don't know. Interesting. So. Uh, tabs, there we go, it's kind of creepy, isn't it? The bouncing babies, but uh, nonetheless, tabs, which we're now very used to with our browsers. Okay, this I really like. This is a table, but we see it's pretty advanced because we can, uh, okay, we can give it a row height here. Okay, you see we have a drop down, cyber green. JFC secondary, gray, like so, black, blue. So a very advanced table, a table but a very advanced one. Tooltip text, all right. Shift F10 to activate pop-up. I don't know what this is going to do. All right, I don't know. We'll skip that one. Um, uh oh, now it's frozen. <laughs> okay, and then finally a tree. I need to figure out. Okay, come on, there we go. Okay. Finally, a tree. This is pretty handy. So you see we can organize things almost like we would with XML, with an XML document. We can organize things into a tree. So each of these is a demonstration of uh, a swing application. Now I'm going to take a bit of a risk here and do something I hadn't pre-planned, but I'm going to try and run my color picker application. And this is one that I wrote, this is a swing application I wrote. Why did I do it as a swing application? Well, we'll see in just a minute. Okay, first of all, uh, I'm going to let this guy run. With any luck, he'll run. We'll let him go. Okay. What this is, this is the, uh, obviously not very pretty because I was the only one who ever planned on using this, but this is the way that I index colors on plantplaces.com. So let me go out and find a plant where I have not indexed its color. Uh, let's see, if I go to say, I think I've got most of the magnolias, but let me look for magnolia. Um, I think I've got most of the mags, so they should be pretty well covered. Let's see, uh, how about, what do I have in rhododendron? See, here's a PJM rhododendron. Do I have this one color indexed? I don't. Oh, perfect. So this is plantplaces.com here. And this is a rhododendron with a very distinct purple color. Look at that picture. Very distinct. There's another picture. This is something that I want to index, okay? And so it's neat because I, I got a bunch of these in Washington, D.C. when I was there. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to pick some of these colors. I'm going to save this image on my local computer. Give this a second. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm going to save it in my documents, my uh, plant places. That's fine. Okay. I'm going to keep the file name the same. So Roto PJM, we'll save that. Okay. Now I want to get that one, this one right here. Save image as. Okay, Zoo 2009 resize. So I'm going to save that. That'll work. Now I'm going to go back here 
to my color indexing program. I'm going to, and notice this is all swing. These are all swing applications, all swing widgets we're looking at. Open picture from PC, and I put that under documents, and I believe I put that under um, my, and then plant places. Okay, let's try the first um, Zoo 2009 resized. I open this, and notice this is very graphically intensive. Notice this is a very graphical intensive thing. So this is best to do with a swing application. Now, note that I can scroll. See, I have a scroll pane. I can click, and watch when I click, it's going to grab the red, green, and blue values where I clicked and put that color here. Okay, that's kind of dark. That's good. And then I'm going to say flower. I'll put that in a J text field, and I'll choose save color. Okay, data saved. So notice all the swing components that we just used. We have a pop-up box. We have a layout manager. Okay, notice what happens when I resize. Notice what gets bigger, what gets smaller, what gets wider, what gets taller. All of these things I very consciously chose when I wrote this program. Let's say I want a lighter color. Maybe we'll go here, save color. I love these high resolution pictures. Maybe we want one of these, uh, let's see if we can get a dark green and we'll say leaf. Okay, save color. These high resolution pictures make it very easy to pick off some very unique colors. Flower again. And now let's go ahead and save. Okay, now I'm going to say open picture from PC and let me get the Roto PJM. Okay, now we see some different colors here. So I'm gonna save that. Oops, cancel. Obviously, I need to do some exception handling. Save this color. Okay, looks great. Save a little darker version. Save. Excellent. Now, see how easy that was. Let me go back now to plant places. Okay, notice right now I don't have color indexing on this because when I do have color indexing, the color will show here. Watch what happens when I choose refresh on this page. Watch what happens when I choose refresh. Take a look. See that? Those are the colors that we just picked. So um, one of the things that that program had to do was know what picture it was looking at and by the picture name, know how to marry that picture back up to the original plant on plant places. Then every time I picked a color, it had to upload that color to plant places. And now we see I have some very vibrant purples, yellows, lav or purples, lavenders, and such indexed to this plant. So now, if you go back and search by plants, and I'm going to have to just take a lucky guess here. Let's see if I can grab one of those purples I indexed. Um, it will do a rough percentage search. Probably this one's pretty close. Let's see, if I search on this, is it going to pick out PJM Rody? Oh, fooey. No PJM Rody there, but it did get some close ones. So maybe we go with a lighter color. Let's see if it gets our PJM Rody. Um, uh, we have this guy. We have, we're pretty close. We have this guy. That's not exactly the one we had, but pretty darn close. So in any case, the goal here is to see that when we do need to do something very graphically intensive, okay, that requires a lot of computing power on the local PC, Swing might be a good way to do it. And we see we have an image, we have a scroll pane, we have buttons, we have a label, a text field, a little image viewer, all kinds of different Swing things that are working together. And when I hit Save Color, it literally go, takes all this information, pushes it up to plantplaces.com, and immediately makes it live. So. These are different things we can do in Swing. So let's think of some quiz question suggestions. What are some Swing apps we saw today? Swing Set 2, the Plant Places Color Picker, okay, uh, Argo UML, and NetBeans. What's the difference between a thin client and a fat client? Fat client typically runs using the computing power of the device it's on, either a laptop, PC, or a phone. Thin client, most of the logic is somewhere else, and the user is simply interacting with it with a, a user interface that's, that doesn't have a lot of intelligence. All the logic is centrally stored on a central server. 
Okay. Uh, we know that layout managers are important ways to make resizability. If we take a look at this, for example, what do we have here? And it's funny, I didn't make this for a classroom demonstration, but it happens to work out well. We have a border layout. Up here is north. Within that, we have a flow layout, because you notice that every component is right next to each other. Red, green, blue, which shows the numerical values from 0 to 255 for each of those. So we have a border layout with north. Within north, we have a flow layout. Then we have a center section. That center section will get bigger and smaller as I expand. Okay, and that's actually a, a scroll pane, whoops, sorry, so that I can scroll and I can see more of a picture if I choose. Now at the bottom, notice that each of these elements are equally sized. So at the bottom, we do have the south part of a border layout, but within that, we have a grid layout with two columns because all the buttons, the label, the text field, they're all equally sized. So layout management is something that we want to pay important attention to. We know that the Swing Set 2 application that we looked at showed us a bunch of different ways that we can use Swing applications. And we know that a radio button, you can only select one from a group, but a checkbox, you can select multiple from a group. So, lots of different things we can look at. Put these under quiz question suggestions for the exam, and we'll cover this in the exam. We will probably also cover this in the quiz that follows the exam. So, uh, that would probably, I believe that would be quiz five. So, questions from this can go either in exam, uh, or quiz five or both. And we're going to have one more, uh, probably one more lecture where we're actually going to continue to build our J-frame. But for now, I'll go ahead and stop this one and we'll start our next lecture in a moment. Thank you.